Less time separates us from Julius Caesar than him from the builders of the pyramids. When we talk about the ancient world, we really have trouble keeping that in mind. The normal way to divide history is to split into three periods, or the ancient, medieval, and modern worlds. However, we don't see that the ancient world was there for a very, very, very long time. Civilizations rose and fell, and then rose and fell again ad infinitum before Alexander the Great or the Roman emperors drew breath. The greatest of the civilizations of the old, old world was Mesopotamia. For the first 3,000 years of human civilization, the center of the world was between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in modern Iraq. Although this might seem obscure to us now, history keeps on repeating or at the very least rhyming, and so we might learn a thing or two from the mistakes of leaders with names like Ila Kabkabu or Puzur Ashur III. Even barring that, it's still an interesting story. This video will recount the rise and fall of Mesopotamian civilization, what made them so successful in their own time, what they added to the world, and finally what did them in is their tragic flaw. Get into your chariot with your bronze plate mail for one of the longest lived civilizations of all time. The ancient Mesopotamians were experts in a variety of fields, and learning these skills requires a lot of self-discipline. At Skillshare, you can learn any number of skills that can enrich your life and make you an expert. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative people, where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes in stuff like graphic design, photography, creative writing, animation, marketing, and web development. Self-discipline goes a long way to developing skills, and Skillshare has classes just for that, like one by Thomas Frank, which helps develop your mindset to fit a self-imposed schedule and increase your productivity. Skillshare is designed to help you learn. There are no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes so you can explore something new and focus on building skills that will last a lifetime. No matter who you are, you can benefit by visiting Skillshare and finding something that interests you. The first 1,000 people to use this link will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare, so go ahead, click that link, and start learning skills today. I remember seeing a survey in the What If Altist fan reddit for which civilization explains video people wanted next. It was all modern civilizations like Chinese, Islamic, or Indian, and I wrote Classical Civilization was the next video in the comments section. Actually, this is the second video of three in a row I'm making up the history of civilizations. I thought I'd throw in a more obscure ancient civilization here to throw you all off guard and just to do the topic justice. For the ancient history nerds here, when I talk about Mesopotamian civilization, I'm referring just to the societies in modern Iraq. In some way, the Phoenicians and their relatives, the Canaanites, are pretty similar, but from my research, I came to the conclusion they were different in some really fundamental ways. Similarly, the peoples of all the other surrounding nations, like the Hittites, Armenians, Persians, and Elamites, were really culturally different, and so aren't even close to warranting being part of Mesopotamian civilization. Agriculture started at the end of the last Ice Age somewhere around modern Kurdistan or northern Syria. From everything we can gather from the archaeological record, this was an incredible era with a lot going on. This included a really bitter mini-Ice Age, possibly caused by a comet strike on Canada, massive flooding, mixing of three distinct races into modern Middle Easterners, and then their migration across Western Eurasia, some of the worst plagues in human history alongside the extinction of the Ice Age wildlife like the mammoth. In summary, fun times. The world immediately after the end of the last Ice Age was warmer than the present, which had a series of complicated and far-reaching effects, which included the Middle East and Sahara being wet. In areas of the Sahara where today the only inhabitants are sand dunes, we have cave paintings that show herds of cattle drinking by rivers with hippos. Lake Chad in Africa was four times its current size and was given the extremely appropriate name Lake Mega Chad. However, this meant that the Middle East really was the land of milk and honey. Southern Iraq, or the future heartland of Mesopotamian civilization, was a fertile swampland where the native population lived as hunter-gatherers surrounded by farmers. However, as the climate cooled, the monsoon pattern switched. This turned what used to be a fertile grassland into harsh desert. The old swampland shrank markedly, which meant that the traditional lifestyles just couldn't survive. This created a series of profound shifts that forced civilization to happen. You see, people really don't like being civilized that much, or at least tribal peoples really try hard to not develop centralized government and bureaucratic systems, since those institutions will just try to limit their freedom and tax them. 
people tend to like traditional tribal systems where if you dislike the chieftain, you can just immigrate to another tribal group or start your own tribe. Or alternatively, where a council of tribal elders or social customs have to submit to a king or a strict legal code. Likewise, it's extremely rare to see hunter-gatherer peoples willingly submit to agriculture. The history and spread of agriculture around the world has largely been the story of genocide. This is why it took 6,000 years after the invention of agriculture for civilization to develop, and why it took so long to spread around the world after that. Only in the last couple hundred years have civilizations controlled the majority of the world. The thing that forced civilization to develop first in Mesopotamia, or the term for modern Iraq, was control of water. Mesopotamia is Greek for land between the rivers, and that's because this region lies between the Tigris and Euphrates. Rivers that in real terms are defined by their general nastiness and propensity to flash flood. When the region dried out, people had to get their water for farming from the rivers, but the rivers were really terrible. They had to be controlled in order to provide any degree of predictability that developed societies demanded. This required large concentrations of workers or labor in order to make all the dams, canals, and dikes to keep the farms operating. Once you had a lot of workers doing a single task, you had to develop the complicated supply systems that would keep them fed, rules to manage relations between people of different cultures, and centralized leadership to direct them in an organized manner. Due to the shift in climate, Mesopotamia went from a society with lots of small villages to one of big cities relying on irrigation to maintain their farms. An example of how urbanized Mesopotamia could be was that Ur, or one of the most important early cities, was 90% urban. As an example, the modern United States, an industrialized modern state, 75% urban, and almost all pre-industrial societies were over 90% rural. A series of city-states developed in modern south-central Iraq. The general scheme was that these were overcrowded villages, which, due to the lack of effective weaponry to seize city walls, were unable to conquer each other and form centralized countries. And so the villages just got bigger and bigger, building walls around their swollen size. Some names of these places are Ur, Lagash, Uma, and Kish. When I say 90% of the population was urban, that's because the farmers lived inside the city walls since the outside was unsafe due to intra-city warfare. Mesopotamian society became heavily about mobilizing labor. Labor was the main thing people used to wage war, dig irrigation ditches, and the like. I once read an interesting history book which said that the high walls of Mesopotamian cities were as driven by the desire to keep slaves and serfs in rather than keep enemies out. With the brutal shift in their environment, the Mesopotamians were deeply horrified and curious about what had gone wrong. In trying to answer this, they and by extension we will look into the driving force of Mesopotamian society, the priests and religion. Something that's fundamentally important to know in order to understand the ancient world in general, whether the Greeks, Romans, ancient Chinese, etc., is that their views on religion were extremely different than ours. Christianity is a guilt-based religion, or God is like a great juror that judges you for doing the wrong thing, or Asian religions are shame-based, and bringing honor upon your family and clan is the most important thing. The religions of the ancient world were fear-based, or that the gods were like scary big cats that you gave steaks to so that they didn't eat your children. This was the case in the entire ancient world, but was even more so in Mesopotamia. A good example of this is the Mesopotamian creation myth in which the more powerful gods ordered the lesser gods to do chores for them. However, the lesser gods were too lazy to do that, and so made humans to do the chores for them. In the Mesopotamian pantheon, it was the duty of the temples, effectively living off taxpayer money, to provide the gods with clothing, spectacular housing, food, and sex, in order to please them, since man's only role was to serve the gods. Alternatively, in the original Mesopotamian version of the Bible's flood myth, the reason the gods sent a flood down to destroy humanity was that humans were getting too populous and thus too loud, and the gods were having trouble sleeping. I've been reading a good amount of psychology lately, and Mesopotamia's mythology is almost like that an abused child would make up, having internalized the narrative that it's permanently morally at fault by being born and that reality itself is unhappy. In a lot of ways, Mesopotamian society was abused in its infancy by virtue of being so pwned by its natural environment, which must have seemed like an objective negative verdict from the gods. A Babylonian myth that summarized the Mesopotamian worldview pretty well is that of the battle between Marduk and Tiamat. The world was created when Marduk, the god of order, slayed the evil dragon goddess of salt water and chaos alongside her wicked army. This allowed the stability on which the world was formed. In the Mesopotamian worldview, the civilized world's in a permanent struggle against the evil forces of natural chaos and the form of rivers, natural disasters, and weather flukes, alongside human chaos like barbarians. The government was the agent of human safety, guiding the masses in a directed way to keep us all from dying. 
Another very important thing to understand about Mesopotamian religion is how magical worldviews work. Magic systems around the world and history work like this, in that there are sympathetic connections between things that are otherwise not related. Mesopotamians thought that copper statues in the temples were literally gods since people and things had mystical connections. The statue of the god was mystically connected to real divine forces in the same way that a voodoo doll full of needles is supposed to have mystical connection to human beings who's supposed to start feeling actual physical pain when stabbed. Astrology is a very good example of this way of thinking in the modern world in which these planets are mystically connected with people born in similar dates. Actually, the Mesopotamians developed astrology in order to find out its magical purposes and also create a calendar for planting and harvesting. The great irony is that astrology is the origin of later science, in that astrology is forced at least a little bit to follow objective measurements, the exactness of which became the model for the Greek logical systems. The Mesopotamian worldview was almost entirely built off these mystical connections without any other broader logical system. I'm not joking. Mesopotamian society had no conception of history, thinking that the world emerged as it exists now. Natural laws, since the natural world, whether the sun, rivers, or forests, was just a series of gods with feelings that needed to be placated. The Mesopotamian religious worldview in which the only thing that really mattered was honoring divine traditions made creativity borderline impossible. The artistic traditions of Mesopotamian civilization remained constant over a stunningly long 3,000-year period. Mesopotamia sees less political, social, or philosophic creativity than almost any other major civilization I can think of. People often laud Mesopotamia for a lot of technological progress, but truth be told, they were pretty behind the times in that camp as well. Things that we thought were invented in Mesopotamia, like the wheel, the plow, and the like, often weren't. Mesopotamians did invent bronze working the sail and writing, among other things, in their early years, likely before their priest classes ossified into a set mold, however. In the Bronze Age, farming cultures were always extremely religious, since they were at the mercy of nature. Whether you starved or feasted was largely dependent upon weather patterns that were outside of human control, and that was absolutely terrifying. Thus, in the early stages of their cultures, all of the farming societies were led by a priest class that claimed to have connection and influence with the gods. The right to rule was based upon this connection with the gods. Each city had a patron god who technically owned that city. Even later in Mesopotamian history, when the real political power was handed over to giant secular emperors, they were still technically just the stewards for their gods. Even as official power switched from the priests to the kings, the temples still held an incredible amount of power. They were often the biggest landowners in cities as well as being the historians, bankers, philosophers, a lot of the merchants and teachers of these societies. Their cultural influence was totally unchecked. When we see megalithic constructions in priest-based societies like Stonehenge or the Pyramids, or most aptly for this video, the Ziggurat Pyramids in Mesopotamia, it was due to the power imbalance between the ruling class and the rest of the population. This can either be caused by labor being cheaped to overpopulation, the priest's grip on society being so powerful that people can't rationalize objections or military and political power. Peasants are normally content to have their religion be done with cheap wooden icons and fetishes, but the priest classes like the big buildings since they act as symbols of power. All civilizations change to something unrecognizable from what they were originally during the process of aging. As you're going to see, this was very much the case in Mesopotamia as in any other civilization. Early Mesopotamian civilization was a collection of small city-states clustered in southern Iraq called Sumer. We really don't know the origins of the Sumerians. They aren't related to any other languages in the area. They just seem to have been there. These city-states waged relatively harmless war with each other, in which storming another city's walls was extremely difficult due to the technology of the era, which meant that people would fight over borderlands that would transfer from one city-state to the other. It seems like the early Sumerian social structure was relatively egalitarian. Their governments were controlled by councils of elders, and the militaries were based around phalanxes or blocks of spearmen, which meant that they couldn't be that oppressive since military power is distributed so the masses could just rebel. Women were respected as well, and society wasn't overly patriarchal. However, a long-term shift occurred in Mesopotamian civilization. This was caused by the introduction of the horse into the region from Central Asia. Across Eurasian history, we've found that large centralized empires formed after the introduction of chariots and war horses. Chariots are expensive, which means only larger kingdoms and the centralized governments of those kingdoms in turn could afford them in critical mass. That meant that you saw stratification on both social structures and the unification of city-states into larger polities. 
The first time this happened was when Sargon of Akkad, no, not that guy, unified all of Mesopotamia into the Akkadian Empire. The Akkadians were a Semitic people like the Jews or Arabs who settled the region north of Sumer. Akkadian and Sumerian were shared official languages while Semitic languages and culture gradually replaced Sumerian. Although the Akkadian Empire lasted scarcely longer than two generations, their cultural influence was enormous. Political centralization, just like it did in Greece and frankly occurs in almost every civilization, resulted in greater social inequality and social dissatisfaction. This is since people stopped having stakes in their local politics as they were ordered around by a distant king and the people around the centralized government could exploit the whole kingdom, thus becoming very wealthy and increasing inequality. The medieval Islamic historian Ibn Khaldun had a term for social unity called asabiya. As societies became more decadent, they lost the sense of cultural unity, which resulted in greater inequality, corruption, and the like. All of this occurred in Mesopotamia and was even more compounded by how militarily unbalanced chariots were. As I've said time and time before on this show, equality and political freedom are derived from weapon systems. Fighting with chariots was largely like tanks fighting against unsupported infantry. It was normally just a slaughter. All the governments of the Bronze Age were extremely aristocratic and oppressive since they could be. When people ask me whether life in Mesopotamia was good or bad, I reply, it depends. Remember, you're talking about a civilization that survived for 3,000 years. There was a tremendous amount of internal fluctuation. However, over the process of the total Bronze Age, the life of the average peasant on average got worse. We see the stretching of society on every single level. An example of this is that the councils of priests and elders were replaced by war kings as warfare became more endemic. The Sumerians had a system of having a war king during times of war and emergency, but as that became all the time due to the intensification of warfare, the kings just became full-time rulers, while of course pulling on the temples to solidify their power. Just look at the famous Code of Hammurabi, which was an attempt to create a legal code for the entire Babylonian Empire by meshing a bunch of different local city-state codes. Another example of this shift occurred in mythology, which is the cultural institution we really have to look at to understand Mesopotamian culture, since they really didn't have a well-developed literature. The mother god Ninursa, which dominated in the more magic, priest-based society, was replaced first by her son Enlil, and then by the minor god Marduk of the originally minor city of Babylon. This was since as Babylon gained more political dominance, which we'll talk about later, they in turn made their god the most powerful. Using the logical system the Mesopotamians had, in which gods actually ruled the cities and were real physical forces, it made total sense that as Babylon gained more and more political power, Marduk would become the most powerful god in the region's religion. As society became more and more ossified and political power centralized, people lost stake in the political order. This meant that Mesopotamia suffered under countless barbarian governments as in real terms the local population lost the ability to fight. This process occurred in almost every region that had an advanced Bronze Age government, such as Egypt, Pakistan, Iraq, or Syria, all of which didn't have a single native regime from 500 BC to 1950 AD. We also see similar processes in almost every Asian civilization, in which after the population had been made sufficiently safe by big empires with professional armies, the civilians lost the ability to fight. Which is why, for example, India and China were controlled by nomadic conquerors who were outnumbered 100 to 1. The Akkadians around 2400 BC were the start of a long slew of barbarian conquerors. Mesopotamia's geography really wasn't enviable in that it was a dead flat region with no geographic protections surrounded on all sides by barbarians who wanted to conquer it. Likewise, due to their looser social structure, the barbarians were generally better fighters and in this era of history the barbarians were more often than not more technologically advanced than the civilized governments they fought. For the briefest of summaries, the south of Mesopotamia became part of the Semitic sphere of influence, conquered by Babylonians or Chaldeans, while the north of Mesopotamia generally stabilized under the Indo-Aryan kingdom of Mitanni. Of these kingdoms, Babylon was the great survivor and would continue to be the center of Mesopotamian culture until the end, with the city itself being a veritable Paris of culture and Mecca for religion. Mesopotamian history is so long it's hard to make generalizations, but the Babylonians were on average the biggest winners, controlling the whole of Mesopotamia several times. A really important thing to keep in mind is that all these trends took a really long time to work through, and by that I mean hundreds or thousands of years. When I talked about how long the ancient world lasted in the beginning, I wasn't messing around. For some perspective, the historian David Hackett Fisher found that societies tend to go through cycles of inequality, unity, and social collapse that normally last around 250 years. 
Examples of this in Western history include the Black Death, Thirty Years' War, and World War I. Mesopotamian civilization went through ten of those. I'm completely skimming over a bunch of different crises and individual events in Mesopotamian civilization to get to the broader image. It's easy to look at a 1,000 year trend and think it was linear while instead there were a lot of ups and downs. An example of this is that after Hammurabi, Mesopotamian society fell apart due to internal demographic crisis, followed by only barely fighting off an invasion from barbarian Syrians. Another time, most of Mesopotamia was conquered by the Elamites. For a brief side note, the Elamites are a completely underrated civilization, located in modern southwestern Iran, and that they might possibly be the oldest civilization in the world, existing for thousands of years with an entirely unrelated culture that we know almost nothing about, before being genocided out of existence by the Assyrians around 600 BC. The real heroism of Mesopotamian civilization was that it was able to assimilate all of those barbarian invaders and keep going in crisis after crisis. A great example of this is during the Bronze Age collapse of the 12th century BC, in which almost every civilization in the continent of Asia collapsed, the only one left standing was Mesopotamia. I think this was since the Mesopotamians had a large-scale demographic advantage over their conquerors, the irrigation canals meant that collapse of centralized government meant everyone would die of starvation, and also the power of Mesopotamian religion, which was really the glue that held society together. The Bronze Age collapse is a 20-year period in which almost all the civilized governments of the greater Middle Eastern region collapsed due to a combination of climate change, social problems, and barbarian invasions, probably being one of the greatest turning points in all of history. However, in Mesopotamian civilization, it was more setting into action, turning points that had already started taking place. One of the most important of these was the power shift from southern to northern Mesopotamia. A lot of this was in real terms driven by degradation of soil quality. Southern Iraq had been irrigation farmed for thousands of years and the soil had become very salty, with by 2000 BC 60% of the previously arable soil being too salty to farm. Sounds like a lot of reddit threads to me. This meant a shift in power north to areas where the soil was less fertile. This came in the form of the rise of Assyria as the great power. Assyria was the Prussia of the ancient world in that it became so militarily powerful since it had no geographic protections and so the Assyrians got tired of being conquered and made a kick-ass military. They became the dominant power of the region even before the Bronze Age collapsed, but were knocked back for a couple centuries as they became overrun by Syrian marauders. However, one of the big things and causes for the Bronze Age collapse was the invention of iron, which meant that large infantry armies were able to defeat the chariot armies that had previously dominated society. This shift resulted in a democratization of culture which pushed against the previous aristocratic systems. Assyria became a land of free peasants and a military in which one's position was determined by skill, not birth. You saw Mesopotamian society push against the previous multi-thousand year trend of greater and greater aristocracy, and also seeing the continued growth of powerful centralized governments allied with the church. The Assyrians made the first professional army in history and were able to use new technologies like iron weapons, replacing chariots with horsemen and siege weaponry in order to be the first power to unite the whole fertile crescent, including the conquest of Egypt. However, the main problem with the Assyrians was, exactly like the Germans in millennia later, is that they were extremely militarily competent but terrible at diplomacy and public relations. As an example of how brutal these guys were, their propaganda showed them butchering and torturing their opponents. Take this engraving from one of their palaces, which shows a defeated enemy grinding the bones of his family. Although I hate to use this example because it's just so overdone, the Assyrians really were the Nazis of the ancient world. For example, they wiped out the Elamite peoples of southwestern Iran who had inhabited the area for thousands of years. Alternatively, they burned Babylon to the ground for rebelling, which would be the equivalent of the Americans nuking Paris today. The Assyrians made themselves so hated, in fact, they provoked countless opponents. Take Egypt and Babylon, both of which had three separate rebellions, often led by the same guys against the Assyrians, even though each time the Assyrians won, they committed countless atrocities and retribution. The Assyrians were in such a permanent state of war on all frontiers that they bled their population dry, with especially bloody wars against the Sumerians and Armenians. The Assyrians just didn't have enough guys to fight all the wars they needed to, and by the end their army was majority non-Assyrian which is normally the death knell for empires. The Assyrians were wiped out by an alliance of the Medes, relatives of the Persians, Babylonians, and Egyptians. Assyria was so hated, in fact, that its opponents burned its capital of Nineveh, considered one of the jewels of the world at the time with beautiful palaces and libraries. It's such a warm temperature that it literally eviscerated the place. 
the Assyrian nation was wiped off the face of the earth. When a Greek army 200 years later camped in the ruins of Nineveh, the local population had no idea who built the city or its history, even though it was built by their ancestors. I think this is a really powerful story on the power of time in history. One day you have the most powerful empire in all of recorded history at the time, and the next your descendants don't even remember your greatest contributions and constructions. After the collapse of the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonians took over the Mesopotamian heartland. The Neo-Babylonian Empire is the best remembered of the Mesopotamian states, but it was also the dying swan song. It lasted less than a century in an era of a power vacuum when it really didn't face a lot of strong threats. When you look at the society, you can tell that it was decayed. About three quarters of the population were slaves. The last emperor of the Babylonian Empire was widely hated since he went against the priest ruling class and questioned the traditional religion. Some even theorized that the Mesopotamian elite purposely let the Persians conquer Babylon in order to get their king out of power. What went wrong? My main theory, and this is corroborated by evidence from similar conditions in India and Egypt, is that the decay in Mesopotamian civilization was caused by a corruption of their priest classes, which were the driving cultural force. It's an interesting counterpoint to this channel's previous video on classical civilization, where a big factor that destroyed said civilization was their lack of religion. But Mesopotamia had almost the opposite problem, where religion ended up being a strangling force. In the fear-based ancient religions, respecting the gods' ceremonies and rites was the most important thing. However, as an example, in India before the Buddha, for the centuries before 500 BC, it was commonly said that the priests acted as if they had gotten so good at the rites and rituals of religion that the gods practically served them rather than vice versa. What I mean by this is that you move from a system which the priests performed rituals in awe and fear of divine power and hope that they'd get rain or they wouldn't lose wars, to one in which priests would nickel and dime peasants for exorcisms, lucky charms, and magical protections. Sort of like the Catholic Church selling remissions for sins for the Reformation. Although it's kind of hard to tell since the only people who kept records were the priests and the government that was in bed with them, this probably occurred in Mesopotamia, in which the religion and priest class became mired in bizarre superstitions, corruption and magic over being a force that really unifies society in an effective way. On a material basis, the temples took up a lot of the economy, often being the largest landowners and keeping significant percentages of the population in debt or slavery, being the bankers of the society. A really important point to consider as well is that around the era in which Mesopotamian civilization collapsed, or 500 BC-ish, was the Axial Age, or when people started to question traditional religions, and you saw the rise of faiths like Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, alongside the Jewish prophets and Greek philosophers. In a world in which there was more contact between different areas and religions, believing in the god of one's local stream didn't seem so realistic. Thus, as the religious system simultaneously became more corrupt and also difficult to believe in, the cultural core of Mesopotamian civilization had trouble surviving. Meanwhile, unlike Indian or Chinese civilization, since Mesopotamian civilization was so uncreative, it was unable to reform. Mesopotamian civilization died with a whimper. It was able to survive as long as it could by assimilating invaders, but as the Persians formed a large tribal confederacy stretching all the way to India, they no longer had such a big advantage. Mesopotamian civilization died without a loud noise, with no great final battle. Ironically, the Persians being such nice conquerors meant that there was no enemy the priest ruling class could rally the population against. The Persians being a barbarian nomadic people were unable to replace Mesopotamian civilization, using Syrian or Aramaean as their language of governance. But when the Greeks conquered the region under Alexander, they totally replaced the remnants of Mesopotamian elite culture. After Persia's conquest by Babylon in 530 BC, the pacified population of the region was controlled by foreigners until around 1950 when the British finally pulled out. Mesopotamia was a cash cow for foreign conquerors. Even under foreign conquest, the Mesopotamians were industrious workers and merchants, but lacked any sense of leadership, while their intellectual, religious, and military leadership was sacrificed to foreigners. Even though the capital of the Hellenistic, Parthians, Assassinid, and Abbasid worlds were centered from Iraq, they were controlled largely by Greeks or Persians. This all ended in the 13th century AD when the Mongols burned Baghdad, one of the biggest cities in the world at the time, to the ground and murdered the population, alongside destroying the irrigation canals that made the region wealthy. Afterwards, 
afterwards, Iraq became a poor, lightly populated backwater. Ironically, when the Americans invaded Iraq in 2003, they framed it as a war for civilization, being fought in the very region where civilization had started. The Islamic State's capital was across the river from the ruins of Nineveh, peoples whose relics they destroyed as idolatrous while still being their ancestors. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out my Patreon, where I've got the first couple hundred pages of my cultural history of America and history of the world. Alternatively, check out my social media in the link in the description. As always, thanks so much for watching and have a great day.